Hello. It is really nice to be here. I want to thank you first for joining us for uh, to share your story with the Living Archives. I'm Debbie Rubenstein, and it is May 27th. We don't uh, the COVID metrics as of last week were in Mecklenburg County. There were an average of 72 COVID cases reported, which was a 47 percent decrease over the prior two weeks. And both of us are comfortable in doing this interview without a mask. Mm -hmm. Please introduce yourself. All right. Uh, my name is Paige Freeman. I am currently a senior at uh, UNC Charlotte. I'm a Native American. I'm a proud member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, um, but I have strong affiliations with the Wakamasuan and the Kahari Tribes as well. Um, just to describe what I look like, I am short, uh, pretty pale, light skinned a little bit, um, and I have very curly hair. Um, and I'm currently wearing a burgundy sweatshirt. There you go. Perfect. Um, let's just start by talking about, especially because you're, you're, you're a student here at UNC Charlotte, yeah. which is great. Can you talk a little bit about the other roles that you see yourself in here at, at UNC Charlotte? Yeah, so I am currently the president of our Native American Student Association. Um, I'm actually the one who revitalized it back in fall 2021. So it's been a, a great pleasure to work in that position um, throughout my time here. Um, I work at the Student Activity Center on campus. I'm a student event coordinator there, um, basically just helping with our large basketball events and sometimes smaller events that we have. Um, I'm a TA for a class here on campus. I, I do a little bit of everything. I'm in the all women's choir, the Charlatans, one of my favorite experiences that I've had throughout college. But I'm a, I'm a little bit everywhere on campus. <laughs> Those are just a few. <laughs> and what year are you right now? I'm a senior, so I'll be graduating senior. in May. So when you mm -hmm. started, when COVID started, you were a sophomore? I was a freshman. You were a freshman, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, oh, right, that makes yeah. sense. All right. Um, so are you a sports fan? Is that how you got? No, <laughs> I don't <laughs> like sports at all. Um, so I just, I started working there actually during the pandemic um, because it was an easy job and it was just a good way to get some money while I was here. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of contact with people at the time, so that was a good thing. But once I started working there, I just kind of fell in love with the people and the environment. And I've started to enjoy games and, and sports a little bit more, but definitely not a big sports head. <laughs> <laughs> and how did, you, how did you come to be at UNC Charlotte? Where are you from? So I am originally from Pembroke, North Carolina. Um, my uh, significant other, at, well, then and now, we're still together, um, or we're from the same hometown, and he came to UNC Charlotte, and once he got out here and kind of told me how it was, and I came out here and toured, it, I just felt like this was the right place for me to go. Um, I don't want to give him the credit. I did not follow him here, <laughs> right. but I, I, he was kind of the segue into right. me finding out that Charlotte was the place for me. So he introduced you. He introduced me. That's, that's right. very right. Yeah. <laughs> and then you made your own choice. Yes. <laughs> so you've been in Charlotte. This will be your fourth year. Mm -hmm. yep. And can you talk a little bit about if you remember what it was like when? COVID arrived and what it was like for you mm -hmm. when COVID began? So I, like I said, I was a freshman in college. Um, it was the second semester. So I had completed my fall semester and was ready to take on the spring. Um, we had just got back from spring break probably a week prior. Um, and then that's when we first, or at least that's when I first heard about COVID. And everyone was like, oh, it's in China. It's not gonna come over to the United States. And then about a few days later, the university was kicking us out of our housing on campus um, and basically telling everyone that they needed to pack up everything and go home. Yeah. So my roommate at the time did exactly that. She packed up everything the day they announced it and left. But I stayed until the last possible date because I didn't want to go back home just yet. Um, I was I had got a little taste of that freedom and wasn't ready to lose it. Um, but eventually had to pack up and leave campus. I know a lot of my friends at the time hadn't come back from spring break yet, so they couldn't even go back into their um, apartments on campus and get their things until probably like a month after COVID had started. So they, they were just kind of without all of their belongings for a minute, but I was lucky to be able to 
gather my things and, and leave, which was really, honestly, really hard, um, especially coming from a small town, um, being able to get the experience of what living in a big city was like, which is what I've always wanted to do was live in a big city. And then losing that was, it was pretty difficult going back home, but that was kind of how COVID started for me. Was it, um, was it difficult, uh, was it difficult just because you were moving from a large place to a small place or were there other things that were challenging you? Um, there were other things that were challenging. Um, after COVID started uh, to get worse and we kind of got in the, into the thick of it, I kind of developed a fear of getting COVID. Um, and my family back home thought it was a hoax and thought it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, which is not true. So it was very difficult trying to to live in a place where I felt like my health um, wasn't really cared for in that way. So that was definitely something that played a part into it. But living leaving the city and going back home was also pretty difficult. Was your significant other? Did they also <clears throat> did they also head home? Yeah. So we were about ten minutes away from each other back home. So. Um, once the pandemic started, we couldn't see each other for that time, even though we were so close to each other. Um, so that was also something else that was pretty difficult to go through. Were you able, you said that, you know, not everybody in the family had the same approach. Mm -hmm. um, were you able to create um, a small group the way some people did to, to socialize and to be with one another or not? So mine was actually um, through social media is kind of how I kept up with a lot of my friends and a lot of people um, in Charlotte and other people that I had met since I started college and everything. Um, really, when, when they sent us back home, I didn't really have contact with anyone outside of my family. Um, our local church back home, we started meeting um, outside. So everyone would sit in their own separate cars and the pastor would be at the front just kind of giving the message. But that was about the fullest extent of kind of outside contact that I had other than my immediate family. So that's really so about it. How did you negotiate the differences as a as an adult who was a baby adult in mm -hmm. the eyes of, of your community? Yeah. Um, how did you negotiate the differences and how you felt and how others felt? Um, I just kind of didn't. <laughs> I feel like, especially at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, I was very reserved because um, I have very different political beliefs than my family does. So uh, college is kind of what introduced me to that. And so going back home into a more conservative environment was a very difficult transition that I wasn't ready to face um, my family with discussing these really big topics that we had differing views on. So I just kind of kept to myself. Um, I went out for like family meals and everything and we spent time together um, very often. But other than that, I just tried to not talk about it because I felt like if I did, then uh, it would immediately lead to an argument or something that I didn't really want to engage in at the time because I feel like I didn't have the voice or the words um, to really combat against that. But after coming out of COVID, is that's definitely something that I developed was a voice to speak up for myself mm -hmm. um, and for my beliefs and what I think is is true and correct. So that's definitely something that the pandemic gave me. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. That's interesting. How does that, what does that look like for you now? When someone says something that I believe is incorrect, I just say something about it, like not call them out, but say, I don't think I don't I don't think we're on the same page about that. And then give them my point of view and um, not try and sway their um, opinion or their how they see things, but just to show them that there is another way to view things that the more conservative or more um, traditional way of seeing things isn't always the right way or isn't always the only way. Um, so that's definitely something that has changed. Why do you think COVID, uh, spark, sparked that for you? Um, I feel like just being on social media in a time where there was just so much going on in the world, like not only the pan pandemic, but then also, um, the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, 
um, that kind of just provided me with a, a different way of seeing things that, yes, people are struggling with COVID, but there's bigger issues. Like there's other issues going on in the world that deserve that same attention and that same um, fight for a, not a cure, but like for something to be done. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You said social media community was really important mm -hmm. to you. Was that made up of former strangers or was that made up of fellow students here? How did you create, how did you find that community? So it was some former strain or strangers that I had kind of just met online that we had similar beliefs and that kind of built a friendship. But it was also a way for me to keep in contact with the students that I had met um, during my time on campus as well. So... And especially I was able to meet a lot of um, indigenous people from around the world through social media that I probably would have never met before um, and learn a lot more about not only my culture, but um, indigenous culture as a whole and other tribes that I may not have known about. But building that connection Here in the U.S. or, or outside of the U.S. And as well, usually, typically um, in the U.S. I didn't meet too many um, indigenous peoples from Canada or other countries, but a lot of a lot of um, other indigenous people are from the United States, definitely. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, that's really interesting. So, how did that change what you were doing? You said that that you kind of revived NASA, mm -hmm. the Native American Student Association here. Did that happen before the pandemic mm -hmm. or after the pandemic? So when I first started at UNC Charlotte, um, that's when I realized that Native Americans on campus didn't have a, a place to be themselves and come together and meet other Native students. Um, so the, when was it? Uh, November of 2020, the Native American Heritage Month um, program was kind of like what led me to finally get the ball moving, but it wasn't until a little uh, year later in 2021 where we actually restarted the organization but I, I guess that time away from campus kind of reminded me of how important community is I know in, in a lot of different ethnicity et, words <laughs> sorry right. ethnicities um you know it's it's really difficult to be away from your people and growing up in a in a community where most of us are Native American and having that common um underlying in between us it, it was a very, it was a big culture shock coming to Charlotte and realizing how much I missed that, like how much I missed having that community and being around people who understood Native jokes and just kind of, we were on the same wavelength, if that makes sense. So the pandemic, being back home, um, being back in community, even though it was from a distance, kind of reminded me how important it is. So I wanted to bring that back to UNC Charlotte. And what's the response been? It's, well, <laughs> so the university, we don't have a lot of Native students on campus. Um, so the few that we do have is probably about 50 students out of like 30,000. Yeah. So it's a very small, small, very small minority. Um, but the few that we do have have been very engaged. And, and I've heard that they were really glad that it got restarted because they also felt the same way I did. Yeah. But it was, it was really nice to see that I wasn't the only one who was missing that community. Um, and so once we started NASA, we kind of kept the ball rolling. We had some great Native American Heritage Month programs. And then we actually hosted the first powwow on campus in about 12 years back um, in October of last year, which was amazing. It was Tell me about it. Yeah. So me and um, Michelle Stanley, who is a Native, one of the only um, Native faculty members we have on campus, kind of came together and decided to host that powwow. It was very difficult, just the two of us trying to do it, but it was also a very rewarding day when it finally came and seeing not only natives from other communities outside of Charlotte, but natives from Charlotte and then non-natives as well, just kind of come and just eager to learn and eager to be in community and spend time with each other. It was amazing. Like I'm very honored for the opportunity to have brought it back to campus. That's probably one of my greatest accomplishments that I've had since I've been here. So. Do you, <coughs> were you able to make plans so that it can continue after you've left? Yes, so we're gonna try and, we're actually gonna start um, planning again in the next few weeks for next, for well, for this year's. Um, but yeah, definitely something that we want to continue. Um, that's been a big issue with the Native community on campus. 
because Native students kind of come in waves. So there'll be a big group and then they'll all graduate together and then no one for like a few years. And then there'll be another big group and NASA will get restarted and powwows will start to be planned, but then they'll graduate. And it's, it's just kind of like a, a up and down. Um, so hopefully I'm, I'm hoping that I've kind of uh, been able to create something that can last, even if, you know, our Native students don't come in full force in the next few years few years, I'm still hoping that we'll have some allies who would be willing to um, advocate for us and just ensure that we have that voice on campus that we've gotten the past few years. Because with people who are here like Michelle Stanley. Yes, yes, yes people time, who like right? her, yes, yes. So I know during the pandemic, you also took on an additional role uh, as a COVID-19 um, Tell, tell me the, I forget the official title. Yeah, so it's, it actually happened, um, it wasn't during the pandemic, it was actually like December of 2022, so a little bit more recently, um, but I took on a position with the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs as their uh, COVID-19 program, wait, it's, it's, a, it's a mouthful, it's the COVID-19 pandemic program director. Um, and so basically what my job has been with that is collecting data and research on the impact COVID-19 has had on Native communities as a whole, but specifically in North Carolina. Um, and that's been a very difficult task to take on. Still being a student and working part time like that, it's been very hard to navigate, uh, but it's been more difficult to find research um, that's specifically about COVID-19 and Native Americans, because we always get lumped in with other ethnicities or it's just other and there's not even any you know listed out like anything else but it's been really difficult to just find the research the data but that's definitely something I've been honored to to take on and kind of represent um, the younger generation of, of Native people moving into state government and moving into these uh, leadership positions so yeah. Have any of these experiences changed what you imagined for yourself post-school? Um, honestly, COVID did, like the pandemic. Um, my During the time, I just kind of developed a, a deeper understanding and a deeper love for my culture. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to coming to college, I've always wanted to um, be in state government and work in state government. I, when I was younger, I actually wanted to be president, but that's not the case anymore. Um, <laughs> what changed that? Uh, what didn't change that? Uh. The real question. <laughs> but um, my my time kind of not secluded, but separated from from the outside world during COVID kind of allowed me to develop a deeper love and understanding of my people. Um, that allowed me to kind of transition what I want to do to um, help Native communities through being in state government. So I still have that state government aspect, but uh, keeping in mind that Native communities are underrepresented in a lot of areas within our state and ensuring that our voices are heard um, on the state government level. So that's kind of the direction I'm going in now. I would love to continue working with the Commission of Indian Affairs. They do some really good work for our Native communities. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. If you could, if you had access to unlimited funds and you could snap your fingers and make something happen, what would you like to see state government do to support mm. indigenous communities? Mm. That's a big one. It is. I no, yeah. I I honestly, I feel like um, state government does a lot for our, our native elders and our um, native adults, but not as much for our native youth. Um, so I would want to create a program um, that just kind of kind of I would say like a mentorship program, maybe where 20 somethings or people my age, like pair with a younger native person and just lead them through the difficulties of college, of applying for school and things of that sort, because those are things I was never taught in high school or going into middle school and like all the younger years. Um, I just want to show them that. It's possible. Like you can go away to college and become a better version of yourself, but you can also come back to your native community and help because a lot of our native youth leave their communities and never come back. They never turn back um, because they feel like it don't they that the community doesn't have a lot to offer them. So I want to show them that you can go away, but you can come back and still help your community and better it. Because if we keep leaving, 
then we'll keep being stuck in this cycle of not having enough resources and not having enough access to um, important things that we need to just continue the community as a whole. So I would definitely want to start up a, a mentorship program with maybe even some um, government officials. We have an office right now that are indigenous. That would be a great way to kind of branch the gap between our native youth and, and the state, I feel like. Do you feel like you learned from other communities during COVID about organizing or about mechanisms of change? Um, and, and, and if so, what did you learn and who'd you learn it from? Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely um, being on social media, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, kind of um, seeing the Black community step up and say, we're not taking this anymore. We're, we're sick of the brutality of, of our people dying at the hands of people who are supposed to be keeping us safe. That's definitely something that I've been able to take on in my own life and like stand up for even here on campus. Our university, um, I don't want to bash on them, but they love to um, speak about the importance of diversity, but not really helping the diverse communities that they want to bring to campus. Mm -hmm. So definitely taking a, a note from um, the black community and just telling our university or telling our diversity office that we're here, we're, we're still here, and we want that attention. We want a voice, like we're, we're tired of being looked over as other or as, some, as a minority group that doesn't matter in the eyes of the university. So that's something I've been able to kind of learn and take on. So how long were you all home and taking virtual classes? Mm -hmm. So I um, moved back on campus fall of my sophomore year. So it was essentially that one semester, okay. but it was optional um, to move back on campus. It was only for students who had um, demonstrated a need of some sort to be back on campus. Um, and luckily I was chosen as, as one of those individuals and I was able to come back. And after that, I was on campus. Do you know campus. what percentage of students were here? I don't know. I, mean, did, I know. Did it feel like half or did it feel like it, less than that? It felt like less than that. It okay. was yeah. Campus was like dead yeah. until honestly fall of 2021 is when stuff started to get back to normal. That was my junior year. Um, but yeah, the the time in between then, it was just kind of, I would see people every now and then on campus since everything was virtual. No one was really here. So I was lucky enough to, to be able to come back earlier than so most people. All that year classes were virtual? Mm hmm there was a few exceptions, I think, if I'm remembering correct. Um, in, let's see. So they sent us home spring of 2020. And then fall of 2020 is when I was able to move back. And then, yes. Yeah. So that was right. Yeah. So classes weren't in person again until probably spring of 2021, I think. But during that, that whole year, my sophomore year was just virtual classes for the most part. And what what did you notice about taking virtual classes? Were there certain kinds of classes that worked better? Were mm -hmm. there certain ways of presenting information? What did you notice for yourself about the difference? I noticed that I don't like virtual classes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was very difficult to stay on top of assignments. Um, usually meeting in person kind of reminds me, oh, you have this due on this day and you have this due on that day but just hopping on a Zoom call, or I even took some classes where we would just turn in assignments and wouldn't meet at all. Um, those were really difficult for me to keep up with because it was just, it would just slip my mind. Like the fact that I had any homework due would just slip my mind, which is not good as a student. But that's definitely something I learned throughout the time is that virtual classes are not, not the best option for me. I would prefer an in-person class, which is actually controversial now based on Talking with fellow students, a lot of people got the taste of online classes and they don't like in-person classes anymore. So oh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and when you came back, so you said there weren't many students on campus. Mm -hmm. So did you not have a roommate when you came back? So I did. Um, I had a roommate that year. I, I think I lived in a, a four-person, four-bedroom so I had four roommates. Um, you had like suite mates. Suite mates, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I had my own individual room, but I did share a suite with um, other students. Mm -hmm. But that was actually pretty difficult. Um, I was not expecting it to be. 
um, living with other people, well, transitioning from living back home where I know my family didn't really care about COVID to moving on campus. I was expecting the other students to kind of be more cautious and more COVID aware, but they really weren't. Yeah. At least the people I was living with at the time, um, they seemed to just continue college life as normal, which was very um, nerve wracking for me being around them all the time. Um, we would have testing like every week in the dorm rooms and they would test the wastewater for COVID particles and everything. Um, so I was stressing a lot that I would get sick and um, I don't have any prior health conditions, but I was worried that I would pass away as a result of COVID um, just because so many people in my community, like we lost a very large population of our elders, but then also some of our younger people as well. Um, so I was just very nervous living with other people, again, who had differing views than me. Um, it, was, it was really nerve wracking. Yeah. Were you able to honor the people in your community who passed away? Um, we, so once I moved back, I very rarely went home, um, at least when, when COVID was still going pretty rough and everything. Um, but I know they had some talking circles, some virtual talking circles. A talking circle is just essentially, um, a space where everyone just comes together and you just kind of share your feelings about, sometimes there's topics, sometimes you just share how you're feeling, but they had COVID talking circles where people were able to talk about the impact that it's had on them and um, talk about family members that they have lost. But I don't know if we ever did a vigil or anything for the people that we lost from COVID. But I feel like that would be something that we should probably do because we, we lost a large uh, majority of our Native population. So, yeah. Um. You mentioned your fear over getting COVID. Um, you're certainly not alone in that. Mm -hmm. How did you manage that fear? What did you do about it? Were there people you could talk to? Were there things you could do? What did you do about that fear? N nothing. I just kind of lived with it, which was definitely looking back, it caused a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression from separating myself from everyone. Um, because they could have been somewhere where they had it or they could have been around someone who had it. So I would just not spend time with anyone um, to eliminate some of that fear. But even then, the smallest cough, the smallest sniffle, the smallest sneeze, I would feel like, oh, my gosh, this is it. I have I have COVID. I'm going to going to get sick. It's going to be bad. But it just I just never did anything about it. I just no one really shared the the sentiment with me that they were also as, as fearful as I was. So I just felt like maybe I was out of, not out of touch, but maybe I was a minority in, in the situation and people weren't as worried about it as I was. So I just felt kind of isolated in that. Do you remember how you felt when you heard about the vaccine? I was really nervous. I'm terrified of needles, <laughs> but I had never felt like I needed to get a vaccine more than when it came out. Um, I was wanting to be one of the first people to go get it, but I know that the priority groups and everything, I had to wait, um, I think it was April of 2021 is when I was able to get it. Um, I went to the Bank of America Stadium. I remember that, I was very t scared because I went by myself. I took the light rail there, um, but I've never, I had never been more grateful to get a shot. <laughs> like. It was it was kind of like a weight was lifted off my shoulder a little bit because um, I know that while it, it's not 100 percent effective at stopping you from getting COVID, it makes the symptoms so much less than they could possibly be. So at least there was some assurance that if I now if I did get it, there is the likelihood of me passing away from COVID is, is less than it would have been perhaps before I got it. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like I could breathe a little bit and go out a little bit for the first time in a while. And so it kind of felt kind of felt nerve wracking, but also re rejuvenating. Like it was like, <sighs> just like a little breath, like, OK, we're starting to we're starting to transition into a different era of the of the pandemic. So it was really it was really interesting time. And did others and you can tell me my my own business, but did others around you that you were in physical proximity to, mm -hmm. did, 
did they did they also get the vaccine? And if they got the vaccine, did it did it? And what did their choices? Did their choices make you more or less comfortable, or did it yeah. affect you at all? Um, so a lot of my fellow students that I kind of would hang around on campus also got the vaccine. So I felt more comfortable to spend more time with them, like unmasked, maybe outside in a, a nice area when the weather was good. Um, but a lot of my family back home did not get it, mm -hmm. which means that I felt very uncomfortable going back home um, and visiting home. I think my junior year, I probably only went home for Christmas break and spring break. That was about it, just because I was that nervous of going back home and getting it and then bringing it back to my roommates unknowingly and spreading it or something like that. So it was very, for the the people that didn't get it, I was I was a little nervous, but I don't think it, it fully stopped me from like not being in contact with anyone who chose not to get the vaccine. Cause it is a choice. Like I understand people who, who choose not to, but I also understand the people who, who were like me and kind of needed it to continue on with their lives, you know, so. So, you know, for anyone, when you go to college, um, and then after college, your relationship with your family changes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it should change. Um, can you identify the ways in which your relationship changed because of uh, the age you are and your educational choices versus mm -hmm. changes that might have that you might be managing through because of the pandemic, whether it's different ideas about it or simply mm -hmm. um, the ravages of the community. How, how, how do those two things weigh? How do those two pieces weigh? I feel like the pandemic kind of heightened that, um, mm -hmm. that difference that you usually experience when you leave from college and go back home. I feel like it was that tenfold because um, on top of the political belief changes that I kind of went through my first few years of college was also the pandemic beliefs that I had kind of played into that. So it felt like um, going back home, there's there's just been a, a divide between me and my family, which I understand. I've talked with um, my mother about it because she's uh, the only person, the only other person in my immediate family who's gone to college. So she kind of understood and we, we were able to to have a conversation about the impact that COVID had in that transition as well. And she kind of understood where I was coming from with that. So that was very reassuring, but um, other members of my family weren't as understanding. Um, when I chose to get the vaccine or when I chose to not stay at home and a lot of the, the choices I made kind of, I lost a few people in my life as a result of that, but. It sounds, it sounds particularly challenging that mm -hmm. you are, embracing and defining your relationship uh, with your community in terms that are closer and more intimate, more involved, mm -hmm. at the same time that the community is looking at you with a little more suspicion mm -hmm. than they used to. That yeah. sounds like a real challenge. Yeah. It was definitely because um, a lot of the majority of the students that I went to high school with chose to go to a local college back home, UNCP. And so when I chose to leave, that was kind of one signal to the community um, that maybe I wasn't as dedicated to our, to bettering our people as they had assumed. But I feel like going away has allowed me to, like I said earlier, fall more in love with my culture and realize not what I'm missing out on, but that I, that I need it in my life. Like I, I cannot function without... What the gifts are. Yeah, I cannot function without that part of myself because it's it's who I am mm -hmm. it's so it's been so deeply ingrained in me growing up and like cultural things that just differ between me and and other people I've met on campus and while the community may see me as a as an outsider now I actually feel more connected to them than I have in a long time mm -hmm. which is very interesting to to kind of see that that switch if you will are there any gifts that you're grateful for from the COVID experience? Um, definitely the, um, the de desire to reconnect with my culture and just become closer with it. I've, I met a few friends um, through online 
chat things that also come to Charlotte. So it was really nice to kind of meet them in person. Like once we got back on campus, that was a gift that I'm really grateful for. Um, but mostly, mostly my culture, just reconnecting it, bringing it back to, to Charlotte and ensuring that future Native students here on campus have that lifeline if they need it. Because not everyone is interested in being as connected to their culture as some people are, which I completely understand. But having that option there is a great resource that I feel like Native students should have access to no matter what campus they're at or if they choose to stay at home or if they choose to leave, they still deserve that mm -hmm. resource, that connection. So before the interview, we did something called a hand map. Mm -hmm. Is there anything from that experience that you want to share that, that you feel like you haven't had an opportunity yet to? Do you mind if I? Not at all. Please go ahead. Um, hmm. I feel like um, one of the ones I put along the bottom of the wrist is, uh, what was the, the question? Feeling. For that one? Feeling, yes. Um, so I put fear, uncertainty, and then I also put progress. Mm -hmm. So those, those three words are very, <laughs> very different. Um, but I put progress just because since the pandemic started, I've grown so much as a person. Looking back at freshman year me, and I know these are also things that happen in college, but I feel like it's been heightened by the pandemic. I'm nowhere near the person I was then to who I am now. Um, and the university is nowhere near the same. Um, what are some of the differences in both cases? I mean, I feel like I've just, the differences for me in my personal life is like I've spoken to before, having a voice, standing up for myself. Some physical differences. I used to straighten my hair every single day and I have not straightened it since the pandemic started. So it's been curly. Um, that's, Has that been a logistical choice or an emotional choice or a uh, intellectual? Like what? Why? I've, <laughs> well, this is, this is a piece I haven't really been able to connect to. Um, but in my community, um, it's, it's a stereotype that Native women have long, straight, dark hair. Um, but in the Lumbee tribe, a lot of Native women actually have naturally curly hair. And so growing up, I was always told that my curly hair was nappy or it was ugly and it was too hard to manage. So I would always straighten it and keep it like how everyone else would want me to look. But the pandemic and college has kind of allowed me to take back my hair for myself and make it look how I want it to look. And I, growing up, I used to hate my curls, but it's now one of the favorite things about me and who I am as an individual. So that's definitely one of the, the physical changes that I've noticed. Um, some changes with the university, they're, they've been small. They've been really small changes, but they're going in the right direction. Um, fall 2021, we had um, the university created a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that the university stands on the land of uh, mainly the Catawba Nation, um, which they are now housed in, I think, Rock Hill, South Carolina, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that's one of the things that I was able to actually speak at that unveiling. Um, and that's something that, while I'm very proud of, that's something that I want to call the university to take action on. Um, it's a good thing that we acknowledge the land that we stand on is native land, but we should also support native communities at the same time. So we have made progress, um, but small progress. So did they? Is it is it something that they say at the beginning of events, or did they create a physical marker as well? So they they created a statement for state or uh, for university wide. So typically at any event, if someone wants to give a land acknowledgement, they would read that acknowledgement, but they also created a um, rock with a plaque on it right outside the student union across campus, um, which basically is just the land acknowledgement written on the plaque. But um, Do you remember when you first started learning about land acknowledgements or when you first heard a land acknowledgement? So honestly, not until I got to college because being from a native community I feel like we all knew that we lived on native <laughs> land <laughs> yeah um but when I got to college is the first time that I've heard about land acknowledgements and when the university 
um, asked me to speak at it, I was really able to do some research into the purpose behind land acknowledgments. Was that the first land acknowledgement you heard? Yeah, honestly. Um, so it was very interesting to see how the university went about writing the land acknowledgement. Um, there wasn't a native person involved in the process which is not the way that land acknowledgement should be written. And that wasn't something I learned. That was something I learned until um, after I had already spoke at the event and the plaque was up and the university was discussing it. Um, but speaking in that event kind of allowed me to, to understand the do's and don'ts okay. of land acknowledgements and how to really go about um, acknowledging the land, but then also going beyond that. Because it's okay, like I said, to... Say you live on native land, but if you're not doing anything for the communities that have made this land what it is, then your words mean little to nothing. Um, so that's definitely something that I've learned throughout the whole land acknowledgement process. And now that I'm um, president of NASA, we get reached out to a lot to write and speak at other people events. Um, but we always kind of direct them towards the Catawba Nation because while we are the Native American Student Association on campus. None of our um, members are Catawba. All of, all of our members are from other recognized tribes, some of them state recognized, some are from fairly recognized tribes outside of the state. Um, but we do want to give the Catawba Nation that kind of that authority. Primacy. That prim right. Yes, yes, exactly. To um, be the leading voice in, in the conversation around land acknowledgements in Charlotte, because they are the main tribe who's who lived on this land. Place. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, can you think of a time in this process, and we are, can you think of a time in this process when, when you felt you had to step in to help somebody because of COVID? You had to, you or you wanted to step in and support mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. some way? Um, my grandma, when I was back home, she was kind of along the same lines as me, very nervous about COVID and everything. And because we were kind of both so cautious about it, I was able to spend a lot more time with her. Um, I was able to take her to some of her doctor's appointments and make sure she, she had everything she needed. But I was also able to um, take her to get uh, her first vaccine, which was weird because I had already gotten mine. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, she asked me, she said, Paige, are you, were you scared? Did you, were you okay afterwards? I was like, it's just a needle, Grandma. Like, you're going to be good. So it was really good to kind of, in that time of separation, I was able to, to get close to someone who I had kind of taken for granted previously. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was really good to spend that time with her and help her where needed. Um, what did you learn about her? She's a hoot and a half. That's what I heard. <laughs> she's got she's got attitude for days. I understand where I get it from now. That's definitely sure. But she's also a homebody like me. She doesn't really like to go out a lot, and she likes to watch Heartland TV. That's her favorite TV channel. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's great. Mm -hmm. Is she your mom's mom? It's my dad's mom. Your dad's yes. Mom. So <laughs> that's really nice. Well, is there? Anything else you want to make sure to share before we finish? Um, I'm looking at my little my little paper over here. The map. It can also be a story or or a observation or something that is just you know doesn't fit into the map. I mean, yeah. Whichever. Um, I can't think of anything. I think I I covered a lot of the the main topics that I kind of had planned to talk about. So. Yeah. Well, I really, I can't thank you enough. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your honesty and your openness and the stories you shared. Thank, thank you. you.